Kevin Schindler from Lowell Observatory, where he does public outreach. We'll be speaking on serendipity and the acquisition of the selective spectroscope. Great. Um, I'm going to try talking from back here also because I have sort of a voluminous voice. Um, we've heard a lot the last couple days about the work of BM Slifer and his important discoveries and also about the spectrograph that he mastered, which um, he used to make these discoveries. Um, what I want to do specifically is to talk about the spectrograph in terms of its acquisition, how it was purchased in the first place, uh, because it's sort of an interesting story. Um, BM Slifer started here in 1901. Within a couple of years, as we've heard, he really got to know the spectrograph very well. And in 1904, wrote up a paper in the Astrophysical Journal describing the use of, of this instrument. Um, and he just briefly mentions um, essentially the fact that the observatory and Percival Lowell specifically wanted to purchase a, a spectrograph that was very good. And they would use it, as we've heard, um, to um, do planetary research um, from rotational velocities and also um, planetary atmospheres. Um, and that's pretty much what we usually hear in the publications about the purchase of, the, of that instrument. But there's more to the story. And I would challenge that um, the events that I described, if they hadn't happened like they did, we very well might not be here today celebrating Jim Slaver's work. And so what I'd like to do is start out with a story of going back just a little bit in time, and that's the, to the founding of Lowell Observatory in 1894, um, Percival Lowell, was very interested in astronomy, particularly the possibility of life on Mars. And so he decided to build an observatory. Um, so he had to do two main things to make that happen. He had to um, find an instrument to use, because he, he owned his own telescope, a small one that his um, mother had given to him when he was 15 years old. And he also had a six inch telescope that many of you have seen up displayed up at the observatory. But he, of course, wanted something bigger to do with Mars observations. And so he had to find an instrument, and he also had to find a location to set up the observatory. Um, so in terms of a, an instrument, he talked to some of his acquaintances at Harvard College Observatory, um, E.C. Pickering and his brother, William. And they let him know that there was an 18-inch telescope um, that was available that had just been recently um, built. It was built by John Brashear. And John Brashear is a really great character in the history of astronomy. He grew up just south of Pittsburgh, and for 20 years he was a mill worker. Um, so during the daytime, he would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, go to the mills, spend all day until 6 or 7 at night, come home, his wife um, had made dinner and also set up the little shop. They would go out there together at night till sometimes midnight or 1 in the morning, building instruments. And that was his life. And then he'd get up at 5 o'clock the next morning and go to work. And um, so he got very um, knowledgeable about instrument building. And um, in the mid-1890s, had built this 18-inch refractor that he didn't have a home for yet. And so he, um, Percival Lowell got in contact with him. And they exchanged some correspondence about um, you know, setting up an agreement to where Percival Lowell would, would loan it for some amount of time. He wasn't going to buy it, he was just going to borrow it for a while. And there are a couple of letters from the Lowell Archives. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of snippets from them, but a couple of things that will be good to keep in mind a little bit later. Um, May 3rd, 1894, in a letter from Lowell to uh, Brashear, Lowell says, I have just received your letter of May 1st. I have looked over the article of agreement about the 18 inch and made a few changes in it which I trust will commend themselves to you. The change in Article 2 is to prevent a reparable injury from necessitating the purchase of the glass. First of all, he doesn't want to have to buy a whole telescope if there's something, if the little uh, smudge happens on the, on the instrument. Um, Brashear responds a couple days later, I have examined your changes in the Article of Agreement. We think that your wish for the change is a proper safeguard for you, and I have no doubt you mean it the same for us. The only difficulty would be to fix the cost of the reparation of an injury on the surface as it means the refiguring of the entire objective. But I have every confidence that we are dealing with you as one who will see that justice is done all through. So I make the changes just as you have suggested and return it to you. Keep that in mind. 
It's going to come back a little bit later. <laughs> so, so they've made this agreement, and um, he's got a telescope. Now he needs a place to set it up. And again, he talks to E.C. Pickering, who suggests, you know, if you're going to set the observatory up, go somewhere where it's dark, higher elevation. And so um, Percival Lowell decides to set up in Arizona. Arizona has some high elevation that's pretty dark. And so um, Douglas is, he, he um, hires Andrew Douglas, who had worked with Pickering on other expeditions. And Douglas's job is to take Percival Lowell's six inch refractor, the one that's sitting up at the observatory, take it out to Arizona and travel around the territory, testing the skies in different areas to find a, the place that has the best you know, scene. Um, and so Andrew Douglas leaves February 28, 1894. And his first stop is a tombstone. This is a six-inch telescope. And this is a this is an image of um, some of the locals that wanted their picture taken with the telescope. <laughs> and so um, he started on the tombstone, then went to Tucson, and he found the conditions in Tucson weren't very good for an observatory, uh, ironically, of course, today. Then he went up to um, Tempe, <coughs> Prescott, and then ended up in Flagstaff. And by the time he got to Flagstaff, Percival Lowell was just a bit antsy to get to the observatory set up. Conditions in Flagstaff were pretty decent. Lowell said, do it in Flagstaff. I want to start observing Mars. Um, this isn't a great picture, but the reason I show it to you is that this is the first site that, per that Tom Douglas tested in Arizona. It was site 11, the 11th site of the expedition. And if you go outside the doors and look across the road, this is what you're looking at. That's that hill right there. Today it's called Mars Hill. Um, after Percival Lowell's interest in Mars. Um, this was a big lumber mill over here. That's the lumber mill. And so, um, and so Douglas got to know the locals, and they said, hey, why don't you go up on top of the hill and set your telescope up? When Douglas first came to Flagstaff, he stayed in the house about a block from where you're standing right now, or sitting. So he tested this, and this is what this hill looks like today. Um, that's side 11, it's somewhere, we don't know exactly where, but somewhere right along that ridge. So they've got a telescope, they've got a site. Douglas's job now is to receive um, the 18-inch telescope, set it up for observing. Uh, this is the 18-inch tube, um, and this is on top of Mars Hill. And you can't read that from back there, but this says Mr. A.E. Douglas, Tucson. Because it was sent to Tucson, um, Lowell thought they would probably send it up down there, so they sent the equipment there. Turns out it's in Flagstaff, so they brought it up here. Set the tube up. And this is the one they borrowed from, from Brashear. And they put it inside this dome. And um, this dome only sat on the property for a couple of years. But to give you an idea where it is, uh, most of you are familiar with the Clark Telescope. This is up on Mars Hill. Um, if you look at these trees right here, um, this, is, this picture was taken in 1894. A couple of years later, after this telescope dome was removed and the Clark dome was put up, um, you'll see that it's in exactly the same spot. They had a half the tree up right there. Um, that's about it. So this is the Clark that came a little bit later on. So this is the inside of the dome. Um, they not only have the 18 inch they, that he borrowed from Brashear, but also 12 inch telescope that he borrowed from Harvard College. And that's what he would do, use to um, do his Mars observations. So from May over the next three months, a few months, um, Lowell and Douglas did observations as, as many nights as they could, particularly looking at Mars. And then fall and winter got here. And they realized that Flagstaff uh, gets a lot of snow. And um, by this time, Lowell was back east. Douglas stayed behind. And um, every day, he wrote letters or telegrams to Percival Lowell about the conditions. And almost every day, for several weeks in a row, his, e his uh, emails, <laughs> his letters. Um, his letter said something in effect, um, snowing again today. Um, can't even make it out of a hotel. Finally made it up the hill today, but can't open the dome. Um, that's, the, that's the way the winter was. Um, at one point it was so bad that um, one of the folks, one of the guys who helped um, the observatory, his name was Stanley Sykes, he um, came up with a, with a scale of seeing, you know, the quality of the atmosphere viewing. And, and Douglas shared this with Percival Lowell in a letter, January 14, 1895. On this scale, he said, 10 is when you can see the moon, 5 is when you can still see the telescope. 
Okay, one is when you can only feel a telescope. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the conditions were pretty bad um, in that winter. So with this, plus the fact that there's going to be another Mars opposition, but it wasn't going to be so favorable up here in Flagstaff, you had to go a little bit more south. In 1895, Percival Lowell made a couple big decisions, um, a few. One was to acquire a new telescope, a bigger one, one that he owned, um, and was designed to do planetary research. And that is the Clark 24-inch telescope that came uh, the next year. And this is sort of an iconic image of Percival Lowell with that telescope <coughs> a few, a few years later. Another thing would be um, we want to view the Mars opposition, but not in Flagstaff. Let's go more south. They ended up finding a place uh, near Mexico City, and they um, ordered the 24-inch Clark. It was brought out to Flagstaff. They tested it, took it apart, took it down to Mexico for a, for a few months, did some observing, and then they ended up coming back to Flagstaff anyways, and so they put the telescope back up here. Uh, the third thing they do would do is um, dismantle the old observatory. They don't need the 12 inch and 18 inch anymore, so let's dismantle it, take it back, um, and send it back, send it back east. Now this is admittedly a really bad picture, but the reason I show this is that um, when they took the mirror, or the mirror, the, the lens out, um, Andrew Douglas decided, you know, let's clean the lens before we send it back to Brashear. And this is a picture taken a few years later of this highly technical cleaning process. Here is, um, I think that's the slide, we're holding the 24-inch lens of the, of, the of the Clark. Here are a couple buckets of whatever solution they're using. And that's them cleaning the lens a little bit later on. Um, we don't have any pictures of them cleaning the 18 inch, but it was probably a similar process. And so they decided to clean the lens. And this is where it gets a little interesting. Uh, we got a little problem. Now, the archives of Vogue are very complete. We have letters and telegrams almost every day going back and forth between Lowell and Douglas. Um, but for some reason, this little incident, I've never found in any of the archives. And we just found it a couple of years ago at um, U of A archives. Um, it's, it's in the Andrew Douglas collection, and he was writing his reminiscences about the early days of Lowell Observatory. And there are diff two different things that he wrote this up. I'm going to read from this reminiscence a little bit because um, this, this is sort of the crux of the story. Um, he says, um, some little time before this actual closing of the observatory and returning of the 18-inch, we decided the lens should be cleaned, and we dismounted it and took the two glasses apart and washed them carefully with alcohol. <laughs> Our alcohol supply gave out, and we sent somebody down to the drugstore for more. <laughs> he came back with a bottle, and afterwards we found it was wood alcohol, which was impure. During the process of cleaning, the concave lens was lying flat, and some of the alcohol, supposedly of the same character that we had been using, was poured on the depressed surface. While we were working on the other glass, this evaporated very slightly, and eventually we discovered on the glass a very faint line engraved just where the edge of the alcohol had stood. Such a marking constituted definite injury to the lens, for it was a permanent mark on the lens which any purchaser might severely criticize. <laughs> Remember the agreement they had earlier on. Accordingly, many letters passed between Mr. Lowell and Brashear, although we don't seem to have those. Um, Mr. Lowell had been a businessman and wanted to settle the matter promptly and without uncertainty. And of course, he also um, had a real obligation to make the injury good. Accordingly, he sent Elvin Clark of the great company of lens makers in Cambridge with me to visit Brashear's works in Pittsburgh and settle the payment to be made for this injury. On the trip down, I was amazed to find the celebrated lens maker spending the evening quoting Shakespeare to me. The next day, we spent at Brashear's work, and I learned that he was a great deal of an artist in many ways, as perhaps every creative genius is. At any rate, Brashear did not want to settle the matter by check at the time because it would have him to make a gamble and would not promote good work. Um, however, after talking with him further, he finally left it in the hands of his son-in-law, McDowell, who told me that $400 would do a settlement. We went back with this information, and Mr. Lowell sent a check for $400 to Brashear, who promptly tore it up. And then Douglas goes on to wonder what would have happened if they had sent the check to um, McDowell, who made the original agreement, instead of Brashear. That probably would have been the end of it. Um, but at any rate, um, Brashear was not, for whatever reason, didn't agree with this. So several years passed, 
And um, I always remember that debt to Brashear. And later, near 1900, when we had another telescope, the Clark, I suggested to Mr. Lowell that he give a carte blanche order for a spectrograph, which Brashear could make as elaborate as he pleased, thus compensating for the injury to the lens and closing the debt forever. And so that is the story of how they got the spectrograph. There's, of course, first of all, one to have a spectrograph. This is a picture of it on the, on the Clark telescope. But it's unlikely they would have ordered one, at least of that quality, without um, that, that debt that Percival Moll felt he had to pay. Uh, just an added note to that, um, I'm going to go back to Andrew Douglas again. Andrew Douglas um, helped um, Percival Moll found the observatory. But there's another kind of neat part of the story that that's, I think is worth remembering. Um, in 1901, B.M. Slifer graduated with an AB in mechanics and astronomy. Um, from Indiana University. Well, also in 1901 in March, um, Andrew Douglas wrote a letter to William Putnam, um, our current trustee's grandfather. Um, Percival Lowell had been out of action for a couple of years. He had a nervous breakdown. And so William Putnam was sort of overseeing the operation of the place. Douglas, for the last couple of years, had been you know, having his doubts about the canals <laughs> and the validity of them. And he was doing a lot of tests about whether they were real or not. And he ended up writing a very long letter to William Putnam saying, while I respect Percival Lowell as a scientist and a person, um, a lot of people don't. And they're seeing that, you know, essentially he's a crackpot. These canals aren't real. This is why. And um, in July, a couple months later, um, Andrew Douglas is no longer employed in the Lowell Observatory. <laughs> uh, and as David DeVorkin pointed out yesterday, um, something to the effect of um, seeing the canals as perhaps a requirement of employment in Lowell Observatory. Um, so Douglas was gone. Um, just, I mean, he had been doing all this work to get the spectrograph here, and now the guy who's going to use it is, is gone. Just at this time, Lowell gets a letter from Willard, um, Wilbur Cottrell of Indiana, who was working with um, BM Slifer, and said, you know, I've got this student. He needs a job. How'd you like to hire him? Well, Douglas had just been let go. Um, Percival Lowell was pretty skeptical about hiring somebody else. But he wrote this letter and said, Percival Lowell said, I shall be happy to have him come when he is ready. I've decided, however, that I shall not want another permanent assistant. Of course, he stayed there for more than half a century after that. <laughs> and take him only because I promised to do so and for the term suggested. What it was escapes my memory. <laughs> if going to this decision, he prefers not to come, let him please himself. Um, Percival's not really that interested in having him come, but fine. He'll, he'll have his friend out. So, so two events, I mean, that, that thing that happened with the telescope, and also if, if Douglas hadn't been so outspoken about the canals, if he had been perhaps more like BM Slifer and quiet about it, he probably would have stayed working at the observatory. He's the one that would have used the spectrograph. Slifer probably would have been hired, and we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> so um, that's a little bit about the acquisition of the Lowell Spectrograph. Thanks. borrowed the 18 inch, he also borrowed a spectrograph from, uh, or spectroscope from Brashear. This is the classic one that was built that's on display, but they had other ones that Stanley Sykes and others kind of tweaked through the years also. Okay. But this is sort of the, you know, there's so many components to it, depending on which picture you look at, it looks a little bit different. I'm yeah, just curious, in some of the shots from yesterday, and I didn't see it here, uh, the spectrograph is cloaked in a uh, in a blanket, a thermal blanket. Yes. Uh, was was that standard? For, uh, any chance that those blankets still exist? As far as internet bank answer that, I've never seen them. And there's that there's that blanket and a whole wooden case that went around it, mm -hmm. and um, I've never seen any evidence of that or the remains of the case or anything. But yeah, there's some classic pictures where they have it set up, and uh, there is a solar eclipse in the 1920s that there's a picture of, of that thing attached with that blanket thing on it also. Yes? Um, so that goes back to a question that uh, I was going to ask Laird is, how did they do the temperature, temperature stability? How did they handle that back then? What did they do? <coughs> did you just put a cape over it and that's temperature stable? It may be, yeah, it's just the insulation. 